Well, good morning to everyone. Welcome to the seventh meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. I would ask everyone to remember to turn off electrical devices where the sound or the device may interfere with the working of the system. Uh, today we are looking at fair work and we have a number of guests with us. May I ask the committee, first of all, item one on the agenda is a decision to take items three, four and five in private. Are we all agreed? Thank you. We will then move into item two on the agenda, which is the roundtable session with our invited guests. The format is that if anyone wishes to come into the discussion, if they indicate by raising their hand, there's no need to turn your microphones on. That's dealt with by broadcasting. Uh, to my left are the parliamentary clerks and parliamentary assistants. And could I ask everyone simply to introduce themselves by giving their name, the organization they're from, and it might also be helpful, I think, for everyone if the committee members give their name as well. Uh, I'm Gordon Lindhurst, MSP, convener of the committee. Uh, Jackson Cullinane from Unite the Union. Uh, John Mason, uh, MSP for Glasgow Shettleston and vice convener. Dave Watson from Unison Scotland. Ash Denham, MSP for Edinburgh Eastern. Peter Welsh, GMB Scotland. Uh, Richard Leonard, uh, Labour MSP, Central Scotland. Anna Ritchie Allen, Close the Gap. Gordon MacDonald, SNP MSP for Edinburgh Pentlands. Dean Lockhart, uh, Scottish Conservative, MSP for Mid-Scotland and Fife. Patricia Finlay, Fair Work Convention. Gillian Martin, MSP for the Aberdeenshire East. Andy Whiteman, MSP Lothian. Lynn Henderson, Public and Commercial Services Union. Liam Kerr, MSP for the North East Region. Jackie Bailey, Labour MSP for Dumbarton. Stephen Boyd, SDUC. Gil Patterson, MSP for Claybank and Mulgay, and a chunk of Bears Den, better say that. Right, thank you very much. Uh, perhaps I could uh, start with a general question which members who are, sorry, guests who are here might wish to come in on. The UK government funded Commission for Employment and Skills study came to the conclusion that there will be a continued reduction in skilled trades, manufacturing and civil service employment over the next decade. I'm just wondering if our guests have any comment to make on whether or not that will have implications for fair work and the various issues that arise out of that. Anyone like to come in on that? Dave Watson. Um, I mean, I think that, that's largely right. If we look at the, the numbers in Scotland, um, I think it, is, it, it, it really does impact on fair work. We know that uh, by 2020, we're going to need just under 20,000 IT jobs, 20,000 construction, 20,000 professional services, whereas manufacturing is going to decline by about 15,000. Of course, the big hit is that we're going to have to find 65,000 health and social care staff by 2022. So if we look at that, it's a move away from manufacturing, from agriculture, from public administration uh, into uh, areas, um, some of which are, are, are well understood, like IT and construction, but certainly health and social care brings with it massive implications for fair work agenda. Uh, health and care includes childcare as well. We know from the Scottish Government report this week that 80% of uh, staff in the, uh, in the uh, private and the voluntary part of childcare are earning less than the Scottish living wage. You're, I was giving evidence last week with the, with the health committee talking about the challenges facing social care. These are areas of work which are where low pay, poor conditions, insecure work is endemic. Uh, and therefore, if they are going to be the areas where we need to recruit large numbers uh, of, of new workers and retain them, uh, then that's not going to be achieved while these are essentially regarded as poor jobs that people don't want to take up. So I think fair work is absolutely crucial to the Scottish Government and public bodies workforce planning to achieve the numbers that we need in them. Thank you. Any of our other guests who would like to come in on that? Uh, Patricia Finlay. I, mean, I think there is an issue about the extent to which we, we tend to focus a lot in Scotland on, on, on bad jobs at the lower end of the labour market, but there is a huge concern around what are the transitioning, what's the transition for good jobs. So if you think that those are sectors where the characteristics of fair work are more prominent or more frequent, 
then a reduction in those sectors becomes problematic. And the issue about who, who as Dave says, who replaces, what jobs replace those. Now, there are, if you look at, um, we know that there's a polarisation in the Scottish economy, so we know that growth and employment is much higher in the lower pay deciles and in the higher pay deciles. So we have a very U-shaped um, pay distribution. And that's not just a problem for um, the growth in the low paid sector, which Dave has alluded to, but it's also a real issue for progression. So if you've got fewer and fewer jobs in that intermediate skilled level, um, that's really problematic in terms of how you move people on from low pay and from poverty. Right. I think Lynn Henderson would like to come in. Yeah, just to follow on from the point that both speakers have, have made there. Um, in relation to the civil and public services sector, there, there is, uh, has been significant job reduction over the last 10 years. We've seen over 100,000 jobs lost from the sector in the UK as a whole. In Scotland, across UK and Scottish government departments have certainly taken its fair share of that hit, with 20% of Scottish government jobs being cut. Um, what we see at the moment is a job reduction programme at a UK level impacting on Scottish civil service jobs. The most well-known one will be the HMRC office closures that's taken place across Scotland up till 2017. What we also see is a number of transfers around civil and public services at the moment as a result of devolved powers coming to Scotland and civil servants finding a, a degree of uncertainty about who they're going to be working for, where they're going to be working and what the terms and conditions of that transfer is going to be. If you couple that with the implications of Brexit, there may be on the surface appear like an increase in civil service servants will be required, but there's a very degree a very high degree of uncertainty across the sector at the time of what the future will look like in this sector. Thank you. Um, Anne Ritchie, or sorry, Anne Allen, is it? Anna Ritchie Allen. Anna, Anna, Anna Ritchie Allen, <laughs> yeah. thank you. Uh, just to follow up with a particular point on, Lynn's been talking about the public service there, but just to point out that two thirds of public sector workers are women, so they are disproportionately impacted by spending cuts. And also um, working in the public sector, you are more likely to be getting equal pay. You are more likely to be working flexibly um, and there are more likely to be able to access clear progression pathways. So those cuts do disproportionately impact women as does the wider welfare reform and austerity agenda. Peter Welsh. With the projections of the reduction in the skilled trade, invariably that's going to impact upon manufacturing and the decline that we've seen um, in recent years in manufacturing will continue at pace. Um, that will invariably have an impact on quality jobs and uh, they will be largely unionised jobs as well. And the wages that uh, the workers will enjoy through the union premium will come into uh, will be impacted by that as well. And I think that we need to give consideration about what the impact going to be moving forward is going to be on income inequalities, uh, with the loss of these skilled jobs uh, and invariably the better paid jobs as well. Do you have any ideas as to the answers to the loss of these jobs? Well, I have a few, <laughs> but um, I would start with. Uh, Come back to some of the points that were made in the Fair Work Convention um, that we've spoke about, uh, about quality of job, um, job security, um, voice for workers. Fundamentally for uh, ourselves the GMB, it comes back to the issue of collective bargaining and we would like to see more of a promotion around collective bargaining and the value that that can bring to the economy. We should be seeing it as an economic tool, not just a tool for workers' voice, which it, which it obviously is, also as a tool which can be used to tackle uh, some of the income inequalities and greater inequalities as well that are in the labour market across Scotland. Right. Um, Jackson Cullen. Okay. I mean, can I just echo that in terms of uh, the need for collective bargaining and indeed uh, sectorial bargaining, which I know is a key part of the effective voice part of the, of the Fair Work Convention. However, I do think that... Um, that, that kind of development needs to be underpinned uh, by some, uh, you know, real leg legislative moves. Um, I understand that the, you know, the Scottish Parliament is obviously constrained in terms of, you know, limited powers in terms of employment law, etc. But I'm just wondering. I mean, somebody did mention Brexit. I'm just wondering if the, you know, the post-Brexit scenario uh, should point towards this committee and indeed the Parliament itself revisiting how it can use procurement to influence these things. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were told, uh, and the Scottish Government were advised uh, when the procurement bill was passing, that they couldn't put in clauses 
uh, you know, in basic rights like uh, you know banning zero hours, delivering the living wage, giving uh, you know standards of training, etc., because of EU restrictions. Well, if those EU restrictions are either going or we are going to get into some kind of discussion about what EU restrictions would remain, then this would appear to me to be an opportune time to revisit those, those kind of things. Thank you. I think Gil Patterson had a question. On a different subject, convener, if, if you're happy um, with that. Did any of our guests wish to come on, in on the point that has been made? John Mason. Um, yeah, I mean, I was going to ask about this uh, because, I mean, the general feeling is there's been a lot of protection for workers uh, through uh, being in the European Union, and therefore that protection might go uh, if we left the European Union. But that's right. I've also been wondering, is there the opportunity to, uh, for example, local authorities could then bring the living wage into uh, contracting requirements and all that kind of thing? And I think uh, earlier on, Patricia Findlay said about using different levers to promote fair work, and it wouldn't just be the convention. So I just wonder if these are some of the levers that, that we could potentially use. Yes, yeah, certainly. Patricia Findlay. Um, I think we're very clear that procurement is an important lever. It is currently the case that the procurement guidelines for the Scottish Government have a clause on fair work in them. So it does say that you, um, part of what you'll be tested on as, a, as a, a potential supplier is your commitment to fair work. And that's not, it's not particularly um, more detailed specified than that, but it is there. So procurement is, I think, a very important lever. I think there's also broader levers around the kinds of things that the public sector spend money on. So the kind of delivery, um, the, the money that's delivered through Scottish Enterprise or through Skills Development Scotland, um, for example, as aids to businesses, are also quite important levers. Um, so I think there is a debate to be had around procurement, irrespective of the debate around Europe, because I think there has always been a view expressed in different quarters that perhaps the procurement um, regulations could have been used a bit more proactively. Um, and that's something, I think, that we, we would support, an, an exploration of how procurement can support fair work. Can I just ask? I mean, you said that fair work has to be considered at the moment, but I mean, is it in practice, is it, is it really a major consideration or is it just they're give, being given a kind of token respect? I, I, I wouldn't know because I'm not part yeah, of okay. the people who, who, who assess those contracts. Yes, and I suppose one point to bring in on the back of John's point is the Prime Minister's comments in her speech about that existing workers' legal rights will continue to be guaranteed in law. So I suppose the... If that is the case, the, the big question or the issue is how workers' rights are developed going forward from the point we're at uh, when we leave the European Union. Uh, Dave Watson. Yeah, just on, on John's point, on, on, on the procurement front, um, I mean, I do think we've, I mean, there are, the, the, Patricia's right, there are procurement guidelines that we were involved in drawing up. Um, we, we, we FOI'd every local authority in Scotland to, to ask them uh, how they were using it, and I have to say they all said they went, uh, which is not a very encouraging starting point uh, for, using, for using the guidelines. The second problem is that the, the guidelines is actually, it, it is a bit messy, it's a bit complicated, but there is, a, there is a route within those guidelines to actually deliver on the fair work agenda. Uh, I think we're more concerned that, that people are not using that, local authorities and others are not using, essentially all you need to do is to set a very clear policy and then essentially uh, measure against that. The, however, the, the, there are a couple of areas where which historically local authority and other public bodies' legal advice has said there have been difficulties I think we do need to address. One of those has been state aid, uh, which has been um, pled by, on a number of times, by, by Scottish Government legal officials as reasons for not doing things. So I think, obviously, there is an opportunity in Brexit to look at that. And the other one, particularly in the living wage context, has been the Posted Workers Directive, which, now, my own view is that the, both of those have been used overly cautiously, or the legal advice has been overly cautious from, from law officials on, on these issues, and there are clear ways around them, but nonetheless, they have been pled as reasons for not doing fair work stuff. So I think we do need to look at that as an opportunity post-Brexit. 
Patricia Findlay. Can I, can I also make one point in response to the, con the convener's uh, issue of employment law? I mean, we need to bear in mind that not all employment law emanates from Europe or has been transferred into, into UK law from Europe. So there are important protections, for example, around unfair dismissal, which are within the gift of the, of the UK government. Um, so it's not simply a, a, an issue about what protections stay or go post-Brexit. Some of those areas have um, been around for a long time. They're in UK law, and we've seen quite significant reductions. For example, if you look at the eligibility for unfair dismissal has now been increased um, from one year to two years. That's, that's a challenging issue for people to um, ensure security in their, in their jobs. Perhaps we could move on to Gil Patterson's point. It's actually a Brexit question, <coughs> and it's just the wider implications on Brexit if for fair work, but more importantly, or in particular, how the labour market is likely to be affected and how it would affect uh, people that uh, you represent. Stephen Boyd. Yeah, I'll go, I guess. Uh, I, mean, I, th I just think it's impossible to answer that <coughs> question with any degree of certainty until we know what Brexit looks like. Uh, and until we know what the UK government's preferred uh, approach here is, trying to ascertain what the impact at Scotland will be in a sectoral level, I think is just very, very difficult. I mean, I think in very broad terms, I think withdrawal from the single market and customs union, which looks increasingly likely, is unlikely to do anything to boost manufacturing in Scotland. Uh, and I think the, well, I mean, I think Trisha's already covered the issues around about uh, employment regulation. Um, I would just maybe quickly go back to the procurement issue. Again, until we know what the approach is here, I think we have to introduce a wee note of caution and kind of assuming that Brexit will necessarily open the door to doing interesting things around about procurement and state aid. I think we don't really know that. If we are going to be in the EEA, again, which looks increasingly unlikely, but also if we're going to negotiate a comprehensive free trade agreement with Europe. And even under WTO rules, you'll see some you know, pretty heavy restrictions about how we can subsidise national industries. So, again, until we know what the post-Brexit um, scenario looks like, trying to, well, I think we just have to be a wee bit cautious about assuming there's going to be a lot more scope to do interesting things you know, around about state aid and procurement. Um, Dave Watson. Yeah. Uh, just on the, on the, I mean, I agree with Patricia on the, on, on the legal aspects of it that uh, I think um, that a the, the lot of them are, are in there and, and we need to be clear and clear that the Prime Minister's statement was not unhelpful uh, in, in that regard. Um, I think the, in terms of the labour market, the problem is, uh, is frankly just an absence of data. On the, the day after the referendum, I walked in my office, grabbed my team together and said, we better find out how many new nationals we've, we've got in Scotland's public services. Uh, I'm about to say, by the end of the day, we were not much the wiser. Um, the honest truth is there's very little data. Even in, in areas where you'd expect to have decent data, like NHS Scotland, the, there is an annual ethnicity survey, but it's voluntary, and a lot of workers, frankly, don't fill it in. We might worry why they don't want to fill it in, but uh, often they don't fill it in and, and say uh, what the background is. We've done some work. I mean, we, we, within Uniston, we reckon we've got about six to 7,000 EU nationals in membership, but that's you know, obviously only within membership. It doesn't tell us the bigger, bigger numbers there. What we do know um, is that we may not have hard numbers, but uh, ourselves and the employers in, for example, the health and care sector do know that we have an awful lot of EU nationals nationals and, and other overseas workers working in that sector. Uh, particularly in the, most of our members would be in the residential care sector uh, and that's true for nurses as well as, as it is for other grades of care workers. Um, if, if migration is not, uh, is not resolved in the free movement, if, given the numbers I gave you earlier about the huge numbers of additional health and care workers we're going to need to recruit in Scotland, um, without migration that's going to be an enormous take out of every year's school leavers and uh, you know, unless we get the, the jobs right, at least school leaves are not going to go there but even if they did we're simply not going to have the numbers so I think uh, Brexit has very serious consequences unless we get the migration elements of whatever post-Brexit looks like uh, out of the way. 
By school leavers, do you mean school leavers within Scotland? Yes, I think it's about 56,000 a year, something like that, uh, school leave leavers each year. Now, uh, the other issue, of course, linked to that is that these jobs are gender segregated as well. At the moment, health and care jobs, particularly childcare, but also in the, in the social care sector are pre predominant, predominantly female segregated jobs. Unless we tackle that, you can halve that number straight away uh, in terms of the available workforce. And then you've got to train them up and do the other things. The announcement about 1,500 extra you know, uh, doctor places is fine, but it takes seven years plus to train the doctors. So you know, we're talking uh, long-term workforce planning issues uh, to address that. To clarify what you mean by gender segregated. So I mean, I mean that uh, in health and care are predominantly regarded as women's jobs. The, the workforce is predominantly female, whereas in other sectors like construction, the, the workforce has been predominantly male. Now, if the, if the new jobs are in segregated workforces, then we're going to have a real challenge. Into, so, so part of the strategy has to be to break down that segregation. So it's a matter of perception, not that these jobs are intended to be no, gender segregated. Yeah, but, but they have been for donkey's years, and uh, we haven't been successful so far in breaking them down. Yeah. And, and you referred to there being a gap between the numbers available, if you take even the full number of school leavers, and the jobs that re will require to be filled in these sectors. Can you give a figure on the jobs? Well, if, it, if it's 65,000 extra jobs in health and care by 2022, that gives you a, a flavour of, 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 of the numbers. I, I can recall, I, I spent a couple of years on secondment in the health department of the Scottish Government. I remember we did some workforce planning back then, and I think uh, my colleagues on the on the workforce planning on the nursing side worked out that virtually every, uh, every, 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 because of the segregation, virtually every woman leaving, leaving school was actually going to have to go into nursing or healthcare if we were going to uh, fill the jobs. Now, it's not, that hasn't happened uh, because of migration. Essentially, the gap has been plugged by, by EU nationals and, I have to say in Scotland's case, by other overseas nurses and others. So that's how we plug the gap. Similarly, I have to say in some other areas, I can remember Scottish Waters um, Capital Programme uh, was going to expand, was exp and still is very, very large. And again, there was a question of not having the schools quickly enough. So migration has actually plugged the gap, even in, in that case, more traditional male-dominated areas. So uh, it's a challenge, bigger challenge challenge in, 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 in health and care, but it's not limited to that sector. And does it also mean that if migration means simply bringing in workers from elsewhere to plug the gap, as you put it, it means that there's less emphasis or thought given to forward planning or encouraging uh, people who are here coming out of school to go into those jobs? I, I, in fairness, I, I think thought was given to that and, and, and there was an increase in, in the number of places made available, for example, in nursing schools to recognise that we're going to need these, uh, these back in the, uh, in the, in the early, early noughties when, when we were doing some of the initial planning post-devolution. So I think thought was given there, but the scale of the, of the change, given the demographics in Scotland and we haven't, the population hasn't been uh, increasing that rapidly in terms of the indigenous population, therefore... Uh, migration has plugged gaps which probably would have happened however good our, in, our workforce planning was and if we're honest about it workforce planning has not been you know, a glorious success in in recent years because it's often quite difficult to do right thank you lynn henderson wanted to come in on just to come back in on the the point about gender segregation i think we need to be absolutely clear as anna pointed out public services in scotland and the uk are heavily dominated by women at the bottom grades of almost all sectors of the public sector. In civil and public services, there's more than 60% female uh, staff and they are concentrated in the lowest grades with very, mostly, with very little opportunity for progression up to into any, any real significant career pattern. You will find people, many of my members who have been in some of the lowest administrative grades for 20, 30 years with very little in the way of opportunities opening up to move into team leading positions or managerial roles and very little pay progression. So when you look at fair work and you think about our public services in the white collar sector, there is a significant problem in the distribution of uh, skills and, and pay within that sector. Thank you. And uh, Anna Ritchie-Allen. Yeah, just to follow up on that as well, um, 
I um, completely agree with Lynn what she said there, but looking more widely at lower paid sectors in general, they tend to be dominated by women as well. So that is um, more women than men are in low paid work. Women make up two thirds of the workers that earn below the living wage, more likely to be on insecure contracts um, and in temporary contracts, more women than men are on zero hour contracts as well. So there is a gender dimension to fair work um, and the need to drive up standards and job quality. Um, and so I would certainly urge the committee um, in developing its work programme to consider women's experiences of work and how they predominate in lower paid jobs and in lower paid sectors and how the committee can take a gender analysis and any work at developments on fair work. Thank you. And I think Patricia Findlay would like to come in. Could I just um, pick up? on um, two points that have been raised in the discussion. I think the, the Lynn's point earlier about the, the reduction in work in the public services and its relationship to fair work is quite significant. We know, for example, that we know that that's um, a loss to particular groups. It's actually also a loss of skills that have been invested in. So if you work in the public sector, um, you're more likely to have higher levels of qualification. You're more likely to have had training through your working life. And so therefore there's a social loss in a transition from those jobs to jobs that might be of, um, of lower quality. Can I also make a point without my fair work hat on, but in the sense of my university hat on, there are huge labour market implications for the university sector, uh, notwithstanding and agreeing with Stephen's point that we don't know what Brexit will look like. The reality is that the universities in Scotland are a great success and they are global players and they draw on a global labour market. And we are, my own university is already starting to collate, and I'm sure others are, information on people who were about to come and take jobs in Scottish universities who have decided not to in the context of the post-Brexit um, terrain. So there are big issues for we recruit globally um, and there are really big issues for our sector. Can you give us any indication of the numbers, or even in rough percentage terms, of who the people are that are at your university from EU and non-EU countries? No, I don't. I mean, obviously, there will be a breakdown in terms of both students and staff, but we tend to have higher levels of international staff than, I couldn't give you the figures, but higher levels of international staff than some other organisations, and that's the nature of the global research market. Um, but we, part of that is that people have seen the Brexit vote as um, creating the kind of uncertainty that people have talked about earlier. Also, unfortunately, as a signifier that... that as, as a country, the UK is not open. It will not be a, 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 an accommodating home for them as academics. And so we're already starting to see some of the impact, impacts of that very practically. Um, Peter Welsh. Question for Patricia. Um, <laughs> is there any indication so far what the funding impact is going to be on universities but it, and, and then the impact that that will then uh, cascade on to the quality of the skills that's coming out of universities and how that will, in the longer term, could affect the labour market in Scotland. Uh, can I answer that? Yeah, again, again, there are universities are trying to collate that information at the moment. So there are, the formal position is, of course, that, that people can continue to make, for example, funded applications to European Union sources of funding. Um, the reality is that people have been asked to... There, there are examples of people being asked to remove themselves from projects. Um, I think the more worrying thing might be that people are not invited to take part in projects because of the nature of the uncertainty. And, and notwithstanding, there may be some arrangements in the future that might allow the academic community in Scotland and the, in the UK to participate in those sorts of global funding arrangements or EU funding arrangements. Um, we just don't know what the reality of that is. Richard Leonard. Thank you. I'd like to um, uh, go back to something Stephen Boyd said earlier on, where um, he said withdrawal from the single market and the customs union uh, won't do much for manufacturing. Was that a, a gross understatement? Uh, or were you being judicious? I mean, we know that half of our export earnings come from manufacturing, so that if uh, failure to uh, remain in the single market and some form of customs union uh, could have, couldn't it, quite profound implications for our manufacturing base. And secondly, um, both uh, Peter Welsh, uh, Dave Watson, in his assessment of kind of future projections on uh, labour supply and demand, uh, suggested that there was some uh, almost inevitable decline about manufacturing. Are there those around the table that maybe have a different view? Uh, that uh, there could be, with the right policy support, uh, a renaissance in manufacturing uh, industry and employment. Uh, I always try to be judicious, Richard, you know that. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I think the consequences for Scottish manufacturing of uh, a hard Brexit are, yeah, profound. Uh, and I think some of what we've been hearing over the last few days about the opportunities that lie out with the European Union, I think, is just fanciful. And I think the gravity effects of trade are massive and hugely underappreciated, i.e. you trade with those closest to you. And we've been profoundly unsuccessful about uh, trading our manufactured products uh, beyond Europe over the last few years, and we've heard the UK gov government trumpet some pretty significant percentage increases in our share of our manufacturing going to China, but that's in a very low base, so the percentage increases massively overstate the scale of what's actually happening here. So, yeah, I mean, I would agree, I think the consequences are really profound and damaging. Uh, to answer your other point, I mean, as you know, we've published extensively over the last few years on what can be done uh, to support Scottish manufacturing. Again, I would be a wee bit cautious, and I don't think we should assume as we go forward that if we are successful in boosting manufacturing's share of output, we will necessarily see a similar growth in employment. I think the rate of productivity growth is such that if, even if we increase the share of output, we are unlikely to see a significant growth in employment. And I think we should all be quite realistic about that. I think absolutely boosting manufacturing is, a, I think, a goal pretty much shared across the political spectrum now, but we should not assume we're going to see very significant employment effects. Well, I have the floor if I could just uh, come back to a couple of other issues. I mean, I think a lot has been said so far about the Scottish labour market. Much has been said about sectoral employment and wages. I think we have to be very clear on what we don't know in both respects. Our sectoral employment data is very, very poor. Every month ONS publishes a Scottish estimate they derived from the UK Workforce Jobs Survey. It's not credible. It, is not, it just does not reflect what's happening in the Scottish economy. As far as wages go, when we've seen Gary Gillespie publish his latest State of the Nation address in June, I think, he was using waste statistics, which are the best that we have, but they were an average for the year to April 2015. So I think we have to be you know, very clear on anything the committee can do to, I think, promote the lack of credible data around about the Scottish labour market and help to address this deficit, I think, will be uh, very much appreciati appreciated. Just the last point I would make, again, I think we can be a wee bit too pessimistic about forecasting sectoral changes in the economy and uh, worrying ourselves about how we are going to, uh, how employment in certain sectors is going to be filled. I mean, the, over time, we see very significant sectoral shifts in employment. We don't have to go that far back to 40% of Scottish workers were engaged in manufacturing. And if in 1965 you were to you know, suggest to somebody that you know, it would be 10%, then people would be you know, really you know, quite... Um, I guess, see, this is really a quite dramatic change. But over time, again, due to relative differences in productivity growth in various sectors, we see employment shifts, you know, and I don't think we should cast ahead a few years and say this is, you know, a problem that is, you know, uh, irreconcilable. I think, you know, we, we tend to see these things kind of work out over time. Now, that's not to say, you know, the income effects that Peter mentioned earlier on for losing manufacturing jobs and seeing growth in lower paid service jobs don't have a macroeconomic effect, because they, they certainly do. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, does anyone else wish to come in on that particular question? Uh, Gil Patterson? Did Since by the sector has been missed out entirely and how it will impact and if there's going to be a shortage, as Dave had suggested, uh, in terms of uh, the healthcare sector, what happens to the agricultural sector? If, if we're already taking up the slack or we don't even have enough for, 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 for the health service, how does it impact in, 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 in rural Scotland and the notion that a Tory said that children would pick berries or pick fruit? How, do, how does that work in, in the scheme of things in Brexit? Well, I'm not sure which uh, Tories you're referring to or, 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 that, or that you have your quote right. Yeah, but well, yeah, uh, I, I think, I think, yeah. I think, <laughs> I think uh, we understand the point of the question, I think. Um, 
Dave Watson. Bill makes a very good point about rural areas in particular. Um, uh, one of the things we've identified in terms of the current problems in terms of recruiting and retaining um, social care staff in particular is that the, um, the, the particularly the contractors who are providing much of the service in Scotland struggle doubly in rural areas. Um, and, and there's a whole range of reasons for that, the travelling time, the costs, and for workers in that sector, it's even worse. I, we've got members who are uh, in theory, who are paid for six or seven hours a day, but are working 12 and 13 hours, particularly in rural areas, because they're not getting paid for travel time uh, uh, as they go around, or they're on some form of split or double split shifts, where essentially they're told, oh, well, your next work is in two hours' time. But if you're in a rural area, you know, you're not going to get back home, do what you need, and then go back out again. So um, this is where not just zero-hours contracts, but nominal-hour contracts are, are a particular problem problem in, the, in, in this sector, um, but I do think uh, it's worth us looking very carefully at rural areas. I, I gave an example to the Health Committee of a, talking to a social worker not uh, um, before I gave evidence, and she said that she was given a list of six contractors to provide a care package for an elderly person in their area. Four of the six said, we don't do rural areas. That was the answer to her. Uh, and um, so I think there is an issue there, and I think there is a broader one. Agriculture, I accept Stephen's um, no caution on all labour labour market statistics. Uh, I'm just quoting the ones that, that, that are there as estimates. They probably won't be right, um, but the, the only ones we've got. Agriculture is deemed to come down, and we know obviously that Scotland require, relies more heavily on farm payment systems than does the rest of the other parts of the UK, particularly in England. So I think there are obviously Brexit issues to add to that, and how the agriculture industry responds to that, and how the UK government, in transferring the money to Scotland, remember the Barnet formula won't help us there in terms of agriculture because we need greater than the Barnet formula to reflect our current take up of those types of subsidies. Thank you. And I think, Ash Denham, you wanted to come in with a question. Um, I just wanted to return to this point about polarisation. So Patricia Finlay mentioned this a little bit earlier. So that's the idea that there's this hollowing out in the middle of the workforce. So lots of high pay, high skill jobs at the top, and then a sort of increasing number of, of low pay, lower skilled jobs at the bottom. So I was just wondering if our guests um, consider that this is inevitable, or is there something that, that could be done about this? Um, Patricia Findlay? Yeah, the, the, what I quoted to you was an issue around pay deciles, so it was, it was looking at the particular issue of pay. There's a, there's a more contested argument about whether if you look at skills profiles, there is a much clearer, whether there is so clear a hollowing out, but there's certainly a hollowing out in terms of pay. Um, it's actually really quite important because we used to rely on the ability for at least some people to progress within the labour market and organisations, particularly big organisations in both the public and the private sectors, used to operate internal labour markets where progression was an opportunity. Um, and that, that, that's important because, because that allows people to develop their skills to their to the maximum of their talents, that's really important. But we've seen much less of that, and that's not just a feature of the, the UK economy, it's also a feature of other advanced, um, certainly other advanced industrial economies like the, like the US. So it is an issue, not just in terms of what, what that means for pay progression, but it's also an issue in terms of whether or not people can get the fulfilment from work that we've argued in the convention is an important element of fair work. So do you think there's anything that the government should be looking at? Are there strategies that we could be adopting to try and to help this situation? I'm not sure there are necessarily strategies for government. I mean, one of the things which governments do across um, the advanced nations is that they invest very heavily in skills, um, both through skills and qualifications, both through um, all levels of education and indeed support for adult skills and skills within the workplace. Um, and there's been an assumption for a very long time that if you invested in those skills, they would somehow automatically transfer into something really fabulous. So they would, and they've had no impact, for example, on productivity whatsoever. So I think there's, a, there's been a recognition in Scotland much earlier than in other parts of the UK that there's something going on that stops that. And, and where that happens is in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So there's something in the workplace about whether or not people get to use the skills, which we have spent a lot of money in investing in, to their, um, to their best effect. And that has knock-on implications, not just for individuals, but it has knock-on implications for businesses. Mm -hmm. So my argument is a very, I'm, I'm sometimes thought of as a very simple person. Um, my argument is a very simple one. The resources you have in your business are the resources that you have. Um, th those are the fundamental assets of your business. You can either use them to a maximum or you cannot. 
And the reality is that there are some business models where um, people don't use those skills particularly well, and therefore you don't get the implications for progression. Of course, we know that there are lots of businesses where people, where businesses do precisely that. So they invest in talent, they nurture that talent, they develop that talent, they train it, and they, they get the benefits of that talent being deployed. But we have some business models where that's not the case, and where you've got organisations where people are really stuck at the lower rungs. And as, as both Anna and Lynn have pointed out, often it's, it's women who are stuck at that lower end. So are we talking particularly about management and leadership sort of models? Are we needing to move forward in that or skill up? I think we're talking about management and leadership and business models. Um, so one of the things we've been very clear at as a, as a convention, and I'm certainly very clear from my own academic work, is um, we're certainly not trying to suggest that being a fair work employer is the only way to make money, because of course we now know of lots of very common examples and very public examples of how you can make lots of money by being a very unfair, unfair employer. But I think the argument is about choosing business models and forms of management and approaches to management and leadership which are about building um, fair work in by design. And I think the argument from the evidence is, if you do that, you are not necessarily worse off than any other business. You may well be better off than businesses. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes you've got a market driver to do that. So say you're producing a high quality professional service, you have a market driver and you, you'll, you'll invest in your people because the market is telling you that you need to. Where you don't have the same level of market driver, where you have some sort of market failure, then that's about the design by people who make decisions within businesses. And those are choices. And I think one of the things where I'm reluctant to always talk about how the public sector or government can do these things is a lot of the, 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 the outcomes in this area reflect choice. And I think part of what we want to do is, is the, our advocacy as a convention is to try and influence that choice. And, and specifically to think about the full costs and the full benefits of certain types of business models and employment practice. Thank you. Um, one of the, the points that's been mentioned was about, I think, the public service and the, the what appears to be a failure of the public service to live up to some of the um, gender pay equality, for example, principles. And I'm just wondering, because cannot the public sector lead by example, particularly where the public sector is an area where perhaps longer term planning may be possible, rather than the private sector, if we think of industry dropping from 40 to 10% uh, and things changing fairly rapidly in, in the world in terms of modern technology and so forth. Is that something you have thoughts on? I think, um, I think you need to both recognise that the public sector is an example. Um, quite often when I teach groups of women students, I talk about where you're more likely to have a career that's successful as a woman and you're more likely to have a career that's successful in the public sector. That doesn't mean the public sector is perfect. But the reality is, and I'm sure Anna will come in on this, the reality is that you're more likely to um, progress as a woman in the public sector than you are in the private sector. Um, so yes, the public sector has, uh, has an important exemplar role um, because, and it also has um, levers associated with they're diminished, but more reliance on internal labour markets, where if you can make sure that those are fair and open and accessible, then you can improve equality within the public sector. Right. Uh, Anna Allen Ritchie. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Anna Ritchie Allen. I do beg your pardon. <laughs> yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's different, I know. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just coming on the public sector. So the public sector equality duty requires public authorities to... Um, do certain things in relation to the pay gap. So reporting on the pay gap, reporting on occupational segregation and developing an equal pay statement and also um, publishing gender disaggregated employee data as well as um, other um, data relating to protected characteristics, which to come back to Dave's point about um, public sector employers not having data on how many EU nationals they have working for them is uh, an example of how the public sector equality duty is failing just now. Um, we've had two rounds of reporting to date um, and Close the Gap has done assessment work uh, looking at a sample of public sector employers um, on both 
uh, reporting cycles. Uh, we've seen overall performance to be very poor in relation to employment and gender in particular. Um, and we've seen in the second round of reporting a regression for most of the organisations that we've looked at over the four years. Um, many don't publish their gender pay gap at all, and, and of those who do publish information relating to the gender pay gap, um, there is very little analysis, no narrative to accompany that, and more importantly, no actions to address any pay gaps. So um, we are keenly awaiting the next round of reporting in April, which will be the, the, uh, the end of the four-year period. But generally what we're getting in when we talk to other women's organisations as well is that the public sector quality duty is just not working in Scotland uh, as it relates to Scottish-specific duties. Thank you. Um, Dave Watson wanted to comment on that. Yeah, I, I'm taking your, your broader point about what the, what the public sector can do in this area. And we talked about public procurement. I think that's important. We briefly touched on sectoral bargaining. Um, we think the uh, clear Scottish Government could lead in areas like, for example, in the social care sector, to me, like 95% of the, of the funding in that sector comes from government. So government has real levers. If you wanted to tackle, for example, the hospitality sector, it would be a lot more difficult for the Scottish government to do it. But in the social care sector, it could. Uh, I mean, we're talking about gender segregation and pay. A good example, the same report I quoted earlier, the Early Start report in financing of childcare showed that I think it was 50% of managers in the childcare business weren't getting the discussion to be waged. Now, you know, if you compare that with managers in, in male-dominated um, uh, occupations, that simply wouldn't be the case. Even, I have to say, in other traditional um, uh, job, jobs dominated by women, such as facilities management, for example, you don't see that level of change. So I think there's a, a real opportunity there for government to drive change using sectoral collective bargaining. Have we seen the changes that governments tried to make good changes like introducing the living wage for, for care workers, the implementation of that has been muddled largely because we don't have the sectoral uh, collective bargaining frameworks which frankly would have avoided us getting into the, into the problems we've got today. The third suggestion I'd make is that one of the reasons that the public sector, in my view, in Scotland doesn't always deliver on some of the, uh, the early ambitions is that we have a very fragmented um, uh, system of tackling um, workforce issues. Uh, we've argued for some time, you remember the Christie Commission talked about the necessity of a joined up vision for the public sector workforce. They even talked about, they used the example of public sector workers in Lanarkshire, for example. So you wouldn't have this silo working that, that we historically we have. We think there's a case for a national workforce framework which has some common features. It's not about you know, one form of bargaining for the whole of the public sector, but it's about having some common frameworks which make it easier for people to move between sectors, to make that, that mobility easier, uh, to start to break down some of the uh, gender segregation we've talked about. You, we could ensure, for example, as Anna said, the public sector ecology was properly applied and, and the problem is we've got, just got too many people reinventing the wheel in this fragmented way so what we need to do essentially is have a national framework for workforce issues but then leave then the real important decision which is about local service delivery at the local level where it should be but take away some of the burdens of reinventing the wheel that we get in our rather fragmented system so it does require big some big culture changes but that's one of the ways that we think we could make some real steps forward right thank you lynn henderson to come back in on the um, public sector pay and, and sectoral collective bargaining, I think there is a real issue in the, the central government sector in Scotland where whilst we have, through union pressure, member pressure, achieved no compulsory redundancy guarantees, a Scottish living wage for all uh, government employees in this sector, we have had as unions to negotiate these employer by employer across 46 bargaining units, with some public sector employers covered by Scottish public sector pay policy, covered by ministerial um, guidance, refusing to budge and taking some years to actually put these policies into practice. Now that's due to a lack of sectoral collective bargaining in that sector. I think it's an easy win for ministers, I think it's an easy win for ministers and unions to work together under the Fair Work Agenda to come together in a sector where there is a political commitment to do something and, and rein in some of these employers. Some of this also relates to um, what Anna has described as the, the problem of um, an understanding of the 
equality, public sector equality duties by um, perhaps human resource officials within many of these employers who will do the minimum each year to identify the, um, the, the gender equality and all the equality pay gaps and tick a box to say, yes, we've addressed, uh, we've told you how many women work for the organisation, we've told you what they're paid, but they won't identify disability or they won't identify race and other equality duties. I think it's really important that sufficient training is given to these individuals so that they understand the requirements, which is requirements under legislation, to publish that information. We, we need this as uh, union officials in order to, um, to bargain around that agenda, but there is a lack of... Um, I think awareness and training um, amongst a number of senior officials in the government sector on this issue. All right, thank you. Um, if we could move on now, Dean Lockhart. Uh, thanks, Convener. Just to pick up uh, on a couple of points made by our guests, it's, it's in relation to skills gap and the transition of the economy, the ongoing transition of the economy, uh, which uh, I think uh, Dave Watson mentioned and Patricia Findlay. If we are going to be seeing such a, an ongoing and significant transition of the economy, how can we plan for that in advance? We, we, we know it's going to happen. We might not know exactly the size and shape of you know, how the economy will look in 2020, 2025, but at least we, we, we know the sense of direction. How uh, can we plan for having the necessary skills available for, for the, the economy in 10 years' time? Is it um, Skills Development Scotland, or is it a more holistic approach we need to identify? Which of our guests would like to tackle that first? Um, I, I, I mean, I first bash at it and push it for, for, I mean, I think the... Uh, Firstly, I think it, it, it boils, I know, we, you know, I think probably a lot of witnesses come to committees like this and tell you we don't have the data and we've not, not disappointed you in saying, saying the, same, the same things. Um, you know, we were talking about Brexit earlier, you know, Audit Scotland, who are probably our best number crunchers, were based their Brexit numbers on the 2008 survey, which I think tells you all you need to know about, uh, about the problems we've got with data. So I think we do need to start with, with, with better data. Um, we do need to start, uh, therefore, look at the sort of uh, workforce numbers we need. And I do think, um, you know, if we, if we had, um, we would call it sectoral collective bargaining, but at least if those sectors were talking uh, more effectively, the beauty of a sectoral collective bargaining is not just about wages. We would also be talking about workforce planning in those sectors. So if we took the social care sector, you'd have Scottish care and the voluntary sector and ourselves sitting around the table. Uh, and, you know, we would start to talk about these things and we would be inputting in an open way the data that we have, the surveys we do of our members, the data the employers got. And we would then start to produce some, some, some numbers and some data and some analysis, which means something. Well, at the moment, frankly, you know, there are a couple of civil servants doing a bit of very general workforce planning and it's and you know they would be the first themselves to admit they don't have the basis for doing that so you know they ring you up and they say what have you got and it's very limited so sectoral bargaining i think would be an important way forward the third thing i think we need if we're going to if we then recognize that we're going to have a shortage in certain areas and that you know i've highlighted that that self-evidently is going to be in the health and social care area largely because of demographic change then what you then have to say to well okay we can't, I mean, I've got, I've got big, good quality voluntary sector providers at the moment have 25% turnover rates in social care. Now, if they're on 25% turnover rates now, uh, just think where we're going in the future. Now, so therefore, you then say to yourself, right, how are we going to make these jobs attractive? And this is not just about pay, important though that is. Uh, we talked about qualifications, you know, in childcare, for example, in the local authority sector, we've done a lot of very good work around improving qualifications. In the, in the council sector, your early years, uh, professionals are going to be qualified. Managers are going to be up to degree level standard now. We've done stuff there. It now makes it a more attractive uh, profession. They can see a progression there. And, and, and also it's about valuing jobs. You know, we, uh, I, I did a, a, a piece in the Scots a couple of weeks ago when I was pointing out that our members don't even own up that they're social care workers uh, in the to talk to pals in the pub. You know, that's how bad it is. Now, you're not going to recruit thousands of people into this sector unless we can change that culture. So you have to start thinking about, about how, we, how we make certain jobs, new jobs, more valued. 
And the fourth and last thing I think then you do at the end of that, you do the traditional bit, which is about, you know, how do we, how do we ensure we've got enough people trained and qualified? And that's where more traditional workforce planning comes in when you say, right, we're going to need X thousand more. Um, where, what qualifications do they need? Is that going to be about FE colleges upskilling? Is that about universities and so on? And you do that traditional bit. I suppose what I'm, up, what I'm trying to persuade you is that there are three stages before the traditional stage that we're not doing very well in Scotland at the moment, and that's what we need to do to get to that new area. Thank you. Patricia Finlay. Yeah, I mean, I think I would agree on, on, on pretty much all of those points. That, you know, there are clearly agencies and bodies charged with identifying future demand for skills. So you've got Skills Development Scotland, you've got Scottish Funding Council looking at the university sector and looking at, at professional level or graduate level demand. Um, there are skills investment plans for Scotland, and those are supposed to do exactly what Dave has suggested, which is to convene people together to bring together the best forms of expertise. I think in process terms, it's really important. We're a relatively small country. Um, it's really important that we bring people together to get the best evidence, and, and I take on board Stephen's point about the availability of data, but we do have lots of people who have lots of insights and lots of understanding of key sectors and how you make those what those sectors are likely to need, to need in the future. Um, I think it would be much better if we expended our energy on doing that rather than engaging in the sometimes futile futurology of what the world will look like 20 years from now, because it's not... It's not terribly insightful, it's not terribly helpful to making that transition. I think the key issue around um, making those jobs in areas where there will be a shortage attractive is crucially important. There are some social care organisations who have turnovers levels of 30, 40, 50 percent. They simply cannot keep people in those jobs because those jobs are really challenging, very, very demanding and with very low returns, at least in, a, in an extrinsic level. The last point I would make is that um, one of the things which we do a lot, I think, both in academia and in the policy community, and, and again, uh, across practitioner groups, is we, we spend a lot of time talking about trends and a bit less time talking about patterns. So, for example, there's significant replacement demand for manufacturing in Scotland. Manufacturing is becoming a smaller part of the economy, but it's not disappearing overnight. And so some of the issues for some sectors is that if there's a discussion around um, you know, that's a declining sector. It makes it even more difficult to bring people into the sector. And so the issue of trends and patterns and replacement demands, I think, needs to be factored into the discussion of the kind of changes that we'll see in terms of sectoral, sectoral shifts. Thank you. Stephen Boyd. Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything Tricia and Dave have said, but I mean, I think it can't be overstated too much what a difficult and uncertain process trying to quantify the future demand for skills is. I mean, to give you an example of that, I'm a member of the First Minister's Energy Advisory Board, so a few years ago done a really comprehensive piece of work, SDS-led, working with Scottish Enterprise and the private sector to try and quantify what the demand for skills was likely to be 10 years hence. But then what happens, you see the productivity growth in US shale increase at a rate that was completely unanticipated. There's massive structural change in the global sector and what five years ago seemed to be the most pressing issue regarding future demand for skills is completely turned on its head. So, I mean, I think it's just in terms of what is possible here, I think we just all have to, you know, be quite level-headed about. Secondly, we can't allow ourselves to think about this as being a public sector issue. It's about what the public sector can do to support the wider economy. The role of employers here is absolutely crucial. And I think we have to ask ourselves a number of quite difficult questions. Uh, are the employer community in Scotland organised in such a way that they can coherently articulate their needs in this area? I'm not convinced they always are, although I think sectorally that, that changes. And the third point I would make is we're kind of living through a period where we hear a lot of quite excited stuff about what the impact of technological change is going to be. And we hear an awful lot about the 47% you know, figure of US occupations that were likely to disappear in the next 10 to, uh, 20 years. I mean, I think since that research was published in 2013, what we've actually learned is what we need to be mindful of is what tasks can be automised or digitised rather than what occupations are going to disappear because there's you know, not a clear crossover between them both. And I think we also have to understand that even though some tasks can be automated, it's not always economic for that change to happen. We kind of assume that that will always be economic. I mean, I think what we've seen in terms of the trajectory of UK productivity over the last few years shows us pretty clearly that that is not happening as yet. Now, we need to be mindful of that. I think I said when I spoke to the committee at the 
away day. I think a piece of work looking at what the impact of technological change in Scotland, mindful of our current sectoral makeup, what that path is likely to be, I think would be very worthwhile. But I think again, becoming too pessimistic about we're going to lose kind of. 47% of our jobs over the next 20 years doesn't really serve as well for trying to soberly assess where things are likely to go. All right, thank you. I'm going to take uh, Andy Whiteman, uh, depending how many questions he has, also perhaps take a question from Jackie Bailey um, and then open it up to our guests. Thank you, convener. My question is fairly straightforward. Um, uh, to ask the guests what examples of real innovation in fair work uh, you have noted in Scotland or in the rest of the UK or in other countries that could inspire um, the efforts that are being made to, 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 to promote fair work in Scotland. And Jackie, perhaps we could have a question from you as well at this point. Yeah, it, it, it builds on what's already been asked and you know, I hear a plea for um, sectoral collective bargaining. Um, I'm very conscious that probably nobody in this room would disagree with the conclusions of the Fair Work Convention. But with whatever, you know, the best will in the world, nine people positively advocating is not going to create the step change that we all want to see. So I suppose my question is, what is it you expect government to do? And then accepting that government is not solely responsible for this, what do you expect businesses to do? And do you think the vehicle is the Scottish Business Pledge, given that all we've got is 289 businesses out of a potential 360,000 signed up? So... I'm looking for kind of practical things that you want to see happening, um, whether it's government or business or indeed anybody else. Right, who would like to respond from our guests? <coughs> Jackson <coughs> Cullinan. In terms of the um, innovative uh, the approaches, I have to say that I would be struggling in terms of the UK, uh, not just in Scotland. But in an international dimension, I, I think there are examples that we should be looking at. Um, I was quite interested, I know I was late for the breakfast session this morning, but I was quite interested that the question was asked, uh, I believe, by somebody for Scottish Enterprise about employee ownership. Um, and if you're looking at people having a stake, having a say, having a voice, uh, then there are examples across the world. There's been 82,000 people in the Basque region in, in terms of you know, Mogredon, uh, 43,000 people in Emilia Romana in Italy as a consequence of the Makora law. Uh, and we now have examples in terms of the United States, um, where one of our sister unions, the, 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 the USW, uh, are involved in establishing employee-owned businesses uh, in uh, Ohio, et cetera. So there are examples on that international basis. And, and in fact, when you look at it uh, in that dimension, I mean, it, Scotland is actually quite behind in this. Um, you know, across the globe, this is, the, this is a forum, uh, you know, of ownership, which is really taking off in virtually every country. Um, and arguably throughout the rest of the UK, you know, it's, it's ahead of us. Uh, I mean, I, I've seen stats which show that uh, you know, this sector has bucked the trend at sort of 20% growth in the last couple of years. Uh, so those, those kind of things is things that we should be looking at, um, because I think this does lead into some of the other stuff that's been discussed about manufacturing strategies, etc. We are never going to have a strategy for the economy unless, unless people are, you know, prepared to intervene and try and use, you know, the leverage and the powers that they have to influence the, the uh, position. Uh, and I suppose that leads to, to Jackie's question. You know, what, what do we expect uh, people to do? I don't think that we're going to get, uh, you know, make much progress. I think we'll make some progress, but I don't think we'll make much progress in terms of uh, just leave it to a voluntary approach, to be honest. Uh, there are good employers out there who, who are willing to listen to these things. There are, there are plenty of examples, I know the Fair Work Convention are looking at them, you know, of, of employers who have done good and uh, progressive things. But there are also too many out there, you know, who are simply driven by the profit motive and will use all kinds of, you know, manoeuvres in order to maximise that. So we do need things to be underpinned by, uh, you know, positions coming from government. 
Uh, that means, you know, having, you know, basic employment rights. Uh, but it also means, back to the point I made right at the very start, it means organisations and levels of government beyond, you know, the UK and Westminster level using the leverages and the powers that they have to try and influence the, the uh, position. So we are talking about things like uh, procurement. And interestingly, this is something that uh, I think even local government can begin to look at. Uh, you know, I would, I, I, I would be making a plea and have made a plea to several local authorities that they should be going back to the days when they saw themselves as a local, uh, you know, developer of the, of the economy uh, and thinking about things that they can do to try and influence things and, and uh, 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 encourage things. And even, you know, last week, uh, uh, you know, I think Redfisher Council was adopted the construction charter. Uh, which was a clear attempt to influence procurement with, you know, contractors who do building work for the council, so that they honoured, you know, basic things that are reflected within the Fair the Fair Works Convention. So I do think we we we, we do need that mix, you know, of a voluntary, you know, agreement for employers, but it needs to be underpinned by legislative change. Anna Ritchie Allen. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I would agree with Jackson in that um, we know, particularly from the perspective of gender equality, that voluntary initiatives don't work. Um, if we look at Think Act report, which was the UK government's voluntary initiative to try to encourage gender pay gap reporting, that was a, um, a flop, to say the least, when only uh, five companies published their um, pay gap pay gaps out of 200 that had registered to do so, and only two had done it by grade, which was the, the main aim of the initiative. Um, so I think we've been somewhat underwhelmed by the business pledge. Uh, we would, uh, I think it's been a bit unclear. There is one component that relates to uh, gender equality, but my understanding is that the number of companies that have signed up to do anything on gender equality is uh, a handful, minimal. Um, so we have concerns about that, um, uh, concerns about the way that it's administered in that it's Scottish Enterprise who's developed um, the components and we don't think that the account managers there, and particularly that function of Scottish Enterprise, historically has lacked the gender competence in order to sell it to businesses and actually to demonstrate what the economic case is for gender equality. So, um, and also the measurement of it is, is unclear. So the data that's gathered, what companies have to demonstrate that they're doing is, is, is lacking somewhat, um, so it's difficult to see how any progress will be measured. Um, what we would like to see is, and this goes back to a point about conditionality that uh, was made elsewhere, was that the enterprise agencies, um, um, there's some sort of conditionality attached to businesses that are using the account management service of Scottish Enterprise and High, um, and they have to demonstrate companies that access this public money, what they're doing to advance equality and to advance the fair work agenda as well. Thank you. Uh, Peter Welsh. Myself have already addressed examples of fair work. It's a generic question. Um, but if you look at the hallmark of some of the more fair economies in Europe, particularly the Scandinavian bloc, a larger proportion of workers are covered by a collective agreement. Um, and I don't think that's something that should be overlooked. It's no coincidence. We spoke about sector forums, sector agreements as a, you know, a tool to, to help achieve fairer work in Scotland. Um, it won't be a panacea in itself, quite frankly, nothing will. It will take a multifaceted approach, but what we would like from government is the active promotion of that to work with um, trade unions and other stakeholders across industry to pull that together to make the, the case for that and the benefits that it can bring. And, as Jackson also said as well, um, where we can uh, underpin that uh, through legislation. Um, and that's the brass tacks of it. You wouldn't expect the trade unions to come up with anything other than a united front when it comes to collective bargaining, but it does do a demonstrable amount of good. Uh, thank you. Lynn Henderson. I thank Andy Whiteman for a question that, 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 that had a, a positive um, turn on it, because I think innovation in the Fair Work Agenda is extremely important, and an element that has been there from the beginning, and one that I am personally very proud of, because my union raised us at the STUC and it's come through the agenda, is around the collective bargaining agenda, the representation of, of um, workers that as, uh, around the equalities agenda and also around the environment agenda. It's a, it's a significant feature of the Fair Work agenda that there should be trade union represent, representatives 
for equalities and also for environmental reps in workplaces to raise these issues at a workplace level, at a shop floor level, and begin to have an engagement with managers and with employers around these issues at every level, not just at the sectoral collective bargaining table. So I, I see that as a, as a challenge to uh, the union around the table. We've all been doing a, a, a number of um, good positive work over the years around these issues. We now have an opportunity that is not present in the, in the UK government uh, sector for my members in the UK government where um, our facility time, our union representation is being reduced. We have an opportunity to raise these issues in a new and innovative way and at a shop floor level. So I think that's a really important aspect of the Fair Work Agenda that we need to, we need to say is innovative and Scotland could lead the way in taking this forward. Thank you. Now, I wanted to bring in Gillian Martin and then Gordon MacDonald, so perhaps we could take questions from Gillian and Gordon. And largely, what I'm, I'm going to ask has is, is already been touched on by, by some of my colleagues, but it's apparent to me that the private sector is going to be key and that the economic case has to be made quite strongly to private companies in terms of the gender pay gap, and all fair work as well. And I just wonder sort of widely how, how we can make that economic case. You mentioned Scottish Enterprise, and you obviously have your criticisms of them. But I'm just interested to see here what people think about, because if there is going to be a decrease in public sector uh, employment, and there seem to be the, the, the jobs that offer the fair work agenda quite strongly, we are going to have to make that economic case to employers because otherwise if it's voluntary which it is it's just not going to happen so i'd like your thoughts on that uh, of a similar nature um there's there's no doubt that the um fair work framework can deliver benefits to employers whether it's um, reduced absence levels retention of staff or productivity but how do you get that message across to SMEs? The vast majority of private sector employers are small businesses um, who don't necessarily have any trade union uh, representation in their company or don't necessarily have an HR department. So how do you engage with SMEs to adopt the Fair Work Framework? And given that most of employment law or employment law is reserved, how can we implement any change if we don't have um, any control over employment law? Dave Watson. Yeah, um, I mean, to deal with employment, most, not all trade unions, but the SCUC and a lot of trades are in favour of devolving employment law, and um, we think that would help the fair work, fair work uh, uh, agenda. But it's um, and and clearly it's on our post-Brexit shopping list as uh, as well to to make progress there. But I think there are practical things we can do. Um, there are um, there are some there are there is innovation out in Scotland and good examples um, that we can use to persuade employers. Um, you know, one of those that we point to obviously is the is the National Health Service in Scotland that has um, an award-winning um, you know an academic study found that its partnership approach to industrial relations was uh, one of the most um, advanced in the in the Western world um, having their pin po policies for example which uh, set good standards and I think it's the sort of thing I was talking about earlier in relation to the workforce framework how we get to um, other other um, innovation of that type. Uh, Jason talked about the United Construction Charter. You know, we've been trying to do the same with ethical care, for example. A number of uh, local authorities this month will, will sign up to that as being, being a good model. Getting to smaller employers, uh, which is a challenge for the reasons Gordon indicated, uh, I think one of the models, which is a, is, a, is a good one, and Scotland has led the way in this one, is the Scottish Living Wage Accreditation Framework. Um, the Scottish Government has been, uh, has, you know, 
put, it, put his hand in his pocket and supported that in terms of us being able to put people out into the, uh, into the, into the field there. So we've now got people working, doing that. What they do is, when they talk to businesses, they don't just say it's a nice thing. They actually make the business case for, for the living wage. Uh, you know, and I often, I, when, I, when I go to employers and make the presentation or go with them, you know, actually, uh, bizarrely for me, produce Boris Johnson as a nice picture to go there because actually Boris Johnson as Mayor of London um, you know, didn't abandon the, the living wage in London. In fact, went on and supported and promoted it. Um, so, you know, not someone you might Certainly, we might not associate with a with a with a with a with a with a pro wage um, uh, approach, but nonetheless, uh, it demonstrates the fact that I think there is quite a lot of cross party and uh, and um, a broad understanding that there is a business case to be made. What accreditation staff do is they make that, they explain it, they do it. The, I have to say, I don't think that on its own is enough. Um, um, we also have to do some of the hard stuff. So as we see it, we think there are three stages. What the first stage is that you uh, actually have to name and shame bad practice. Um, now, government doesn't like doing that, um, but, you know, we're not averse to doing it. Sport Direct, of course, has been the, the most recent a example of doing that. Uh, where there is really bad practice, uh, and you know, despite all attempts to change it, then frankly, naming and shaming, shouting about these people, highlighting bad practice has to happen. But the, the carrot, if you like, is the second stage, which is using the good examples and promoting good practice and showing how these businesses have not failed because they pay good wages and do other things. So we promote that. And then the third stage is that is you do the sort of things I mentioned that government, I think, can do to support that with procurement and the national framework, etc. So uh, the business pledge is, to answer Jackie's question, the business pledge uh, I think it's part of that type of process. It, it shows ambition, it shows willingness, but uh, the living wage, I think, is a better model because it has accreditation. You know, it has meat behind it. So if you drift, you will lose your accreditation. Uh, and, and it's tough to get it. Um, so you have to do the things that you need to do. And I think that's the way ahead to get into the wider economy. Well, <clears throat> I'm sure Boris will be delighted with your commendation of his fair work approach. Um, Anna Ritchie Allen. Thank you. Um, certainly in our, our experience of advocating for more progressive employment practices in relation to uh, gender, we found um, SMEs, um, their approach, it requires a different approach to working with larger employers in particular, and we found that SME employers are less persuaded of the business case for gender equality, um, and which is concerning because women are more likely to work in smaller workplaces, um, and as you'd mentioned, um, less likely to have a separate HR function, which means their employment practice is, is, is poorer as well. Um, the research also says, in terms of trying to progress gender equality, that um, most employers um, where they do not take action is because of, firstly, an, a sense of undue complacency in that they perceive that they're already providing equal pay, that they run fair workplaces. Um, and the other reason they don't do it is a lack of priority, which is often what we hear from SME employers in that we don't have time for this, we don't have the resources, we're just trying to um, get to the end of the day and plan for the next one. Um, so one of the pieces of work that Close the Gap has done is to develop an online self-assessment tool which which is called Think Business, Think Equality, um, which was designed specifically for SMEs, um, and it enables employers to go through a series of very short, multiple choice tests um, that take about five minutes, and it gives them a, a tailored report based on their answers, which provides them with a, an action plan where they can take steps, because the research had shown us of, and evaluations of other work that we'd done is that SMEs don't want somebody from an equalities organisation or some other organisation to come in and tell them what to do. Um, but uh, to agree with what David said, something else that the employers have told us from the evaluation of that work is that they would value some sort of accreditation along with it because so that they can demonstrate to um, their staff but also competitors um, in order because they don't see the point in going through that process or doing any work if they can't then show it off to everyone. Thank you. Um, Liam Kerr, did you have a question? Yes, thank you, Kavina. Um, just uh, following on from that point, actually, so the, the way that we're defining fair work uh, arguably increases the overhead and the cost to business of doing business. Uh, so what do any of our witnesses think is the impact of that on the global competitiveness of the Scottish economy 
in the 10-year horizon that Dean's talking about, for example, and SME competitiveness going forward. Uh, and just the second thing I wanted to uh, speak about, following on from Jackie Bailey's question about what the witnesses want to see government doing. So I'm interested in zero hours contracts, uh, because I noticed the Scottish Business Pledge talks about not using exploitative zero hours contracts. Uh, the Scottish Government talks about no unnecessary use of zero hours contracts. Uh, and uh, Jackson Cullinan earlier on talked about banning zero hours contracts. So what, what is actually wanted here? What, what do people want done on zero hours contracts? Well, I'll hand over to Stephen Boyd, who's been wanting to come in on, I think, a couple of points, if you'd like to, Stephen. Yeah. Uh, well, I quickly come back to the previous questions. I mean, first, in SMEs, I know Trish has been doing a lot of work in this area and she might want to come in, but I think it's very important to stress that although the vast majority of businesses are small businesses, the majority of people are employed in medium and large organisations. So just for the purposes of this conversation, it's important to bear that in mind. In terms of making the economic case, and I think this hopefully comes on to your question as well, Liam, that um, I think we need to understand the limits of what's possible here. I mean, Sports Direct have been mentioned a couple of times. At no point was Sports Direct going to be convinced by an economic case. Just wouldn't get that. I'm not interested in that. I mean, the, the UK environment at the moment is we've got the second most deregulated product market in the developed world and the third most deregulated labour market. And that allows a lot of organisations to make a reasonable amount of money existing on a low skill, low pay, poor employment equilibrium. I mean, trying to tell them that other organisations do things better is very unlikely to convince them. But, you know, taking the next step on to competitiveness, and we've been doing a lot of work in the oil industry at the moment, it will not surprise you to know. Now, there's a widespread recognition that the industry has to change and has to change very quickly. And so there's different ways in which you can do that. Now, I would argue the operator that's done that most successfully up until now is Nexon. Now, Nexon have done that by engaging comprehensively with their workforce throughout the company. It involves the chief executive going offshore regularly, speaking to people face to face, and they have seen a big productivity dividend as a result of that. And they've seen very few job losses, and where they've seen them, they've been handled very sensitively indeed. But again, is the structure of that industry in Scotland such that the lessons that we can learn from next and be applied elsewhere? Can we even talk to the people who will be making the decisions? So we meet as a, a group of offshore unions with Oil and Gas UK, with Oil and Gas Authority. All the senior people we meet in industry agree with us about the direction of change. But if you are one of the big American multinationals where you can't make a cup of tea without phoning Houston to get the OK for a decision, what is the chance of you learning the lessons about what's happening elsewhere in Scotland to apply to your industry? I mean, it's just tremendously difficult. So we can sit all day presenting the case study of what next, and there's a couple of others as well, when question be one, you know, trying to do things in a different way, but we are not going to reach the people who can drive the behavioural change in the rest of the sector in Scotland, a sector that's been used to operating a hyper-competition at every uh, strata of that sector. You know, so, I mean, kind of the new approaches that seek to engage your workforce, that talk about collaboration with other operators, really difficult getting attraction with the sector as a whole, even although with the senior people you meet in Scotland, they all absolutely agree with you about the direction of change. So I think it's very different. But the lesson from that is, I think, you know, that what we are talking about here, fair work, I think is commonly understood, should be a driver of competitiveness. I mean, the Scottish Government believe it is in their economic strategy. I've gained, Huge scepticism about the global surveys we have of competitiveness. I think there's, you know, an awful lot wrong with them. But you know, they're all we've got to work with. And again, if you were to look at the companies that consistently perform well when they are in Western Northern Europe, they are um, countries with very high levels of collective bargain, high levels of trade union density. You know, who treat workplace issues much more seriously than we do. Who invest in the stock of skills, but also invest in mechanisms to make sure that stock of skills is productively used within the workplace. So they go about things very differently. And I think it's very, very difficult to argue that fair work is in any way a barrier to international competitiveness. Patricia Findlay. Yeah, I mean, I think to pick up on, on the last couple of questions, I think we do a great disservice to businesses in Scotland if we suggest that we can't find good examples of good practice. Um, you know, I, I, if you ever get an opportunity, you should listen to John Reid, the uh, managing director at Michelin and ND, talking about how 
they collectively, with their trade unions, with their workforce, with their management team, turn round, turned round a business, a global business, um, a part of a global business which was on its knees um, and made it, made it the, I think, the second best performing part of the, the Michelin Group. And there, I think we also do a great disservice to SMEs if we suggest that somehow they are um, atypically represented in unfair employment. SMEs are incredibly heterogeneous. Lots of them are in the position when they are individually or family owned to decide not to profit maximise. Um, coming back to Jackson's point, I actually don't have a problem with the profit motive. I have a problem when the profit motive externalises costs to the wider society so people make a profit which is um, unduly burdensome on the rest of society. Uh, so I think that's a unit of analysis issue. But we have lots of good, innovative, fair work employers in Scotland. And I think looking at those examples in a positive way to think about how do we learn practice um, rather than saying these people are exemplars, so the first time something goes wrong in their business, they are held up and pilloried for not being exemplars any, any longer. I think it's quite important to say, what did company X do in circumstance Y where they adopted a practice that made something a bit better? And I think that's really an important way to try and learn lessons. I quite often think about the, the, the work of the convention and, the, and my own broader academic work in this sphere has been thinking about businesses as forming a kind of normal distribution and you know what a normal distribution looks like looks like that so on the one hand you will have businesses at the top end of that distribution that are doing very good things that for market or other reasons have decided and, and engaged in fair work practices and are uh, uh, um, gaining the benefits of that at the bottom end you'll have businesses and i think that's stephen's point where you will never persuade them the business model is such that you'll just never persuade them to be any different. Your only lever in those circumstances is a regulatory lever. We don't have that regulatory lever in Scotland, and the Convention has therefore not discussed that, or, or, or sorry, has not put in part of the framework that there should or shouldn't be one. The reality is there isn't one until such times, and if such times there is one, it's not an issue that we can discuss. So what do you do with those companies that are in the middle of the distribution? We've taken the view that using a variety of different levers and building from a very small base, Jackie's absolutely right, a coalition of the willing, so trying to find people who would advocate, who would act as role models, act as ambassadors, who would talk within their own networks to try and push forward those businesses who are quite happy to think about how to do something differently and happy to do that in a way that not only benefits their businesses, but to come back to, to Liam Kerr's point, can benefit, business, sorry, not only benefits their employers, can benefit them as businesses. So I have worked with a lot of small businesses in a, an initiative which I lead called Innovating Works which is focused on improving work and workplaces. How do you make business performance better at the same time as you make job quality better? And I worked in the first phase of that with a bundle of SMEs who were in a wide range of sectors, lots of whom said things like, we want to run a business which is fair to our employees and fair to our community. Um, we think that makes us successful. But we take the view that even if, it, even if it dented our profits, we would still do it because it was the right thing to do. So, so some businesses you will bring on, on a, an ethical argument or a moral argument. Some business, businesses you will bring on an economic argument. Um, some businesses you will encourage or discourage using different kinds of incentives and levers, for example, conditionality from services from the public agencies or the role of procurement or the support or otherwise of government in a variety of different ways. So there's lots and lots of different levers. And to think of this as a problem which is solved by a single lever is, I think, problematic. I absolutely concur, as does with the convention, that having a voice for employees in workplaces and in organisations is absolutely crucial to that. But there is very little evidence that being a good employer damages your competitiveness, either at, at at the level of a particular business or a particular sector, or indeed at the level of national economies. There's just no evidence that suggests that's the case. Well, thank you very much. That's a good place to stop, I think. Or did you want to come back in, Liam, with one final question? Uh, no, not a question. I just wondered if I was going to get an answer on the zero hours contract piece. Ah, yes. Um, Jackson Cullen, and did you I'm, want to I'm, come I'm, back on I'm that? I'm glad point? you have come back in, Liam, actually. I, mean, I, I agree with everything that, that, that Patricia has said about the, the, the benefits to the business, to the wider economy, and everything else. Quite frankly, I, I see this for the context of humanity and democracy. If you're on a zero hour contract, what does it mean? It means that you don't know uh, when you're going to be working, it means you can't plan your life. It means that your income is going to be, it's going to go up and down, it's going to flow. 
It means that if, you, if, you, if you've got an economic problem, which invariably comes with being in a zero-hour contract, you don't get access to loans because people will only give you one because you've not got a regular income. We've even had cases of people that kind of get things like mobile phones because they're on a zero-hour contract. It means that people are absolutely, in terms of their own self-esteem, absolutely at the beck and call and under the control of other people. Now, if you think about fair work, for me, that's what fair work should be, as people having a say, as people being treated as human beings who contribute to something. For too many people in this country, when you go to work, somebody else tells you what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and how much you're going to get in, in return for it. All we're asking for here is for people to have a say and to have a voice. And I don't think in this day and age it should be too much to ask that people know that if they go to work, they know how long and, 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 and what the hours will be when they're actually going to be asked to be at work. What about self-employed people? Well, I'm glad you've asked that as well. Because there are people who make a choice to be self-employed, but there are also far too many people in this country who are bogus self-employed. In the construction industry, you have tens of thousands of people who are employed through employment agencies or umbrella companies who are ripping off their national insurance every day and, more importantly, are taken absolutely out with the realms of any kind of employment law protection. One of the reasons why you've got a blacklisting problem in this country is because people in the construction industry have been employed under bogus self-employed contracts when they take that employer to court when they have been blacklisted and things have happened and, and, and they've been unfairly dismissed. They can't win their case because under employment law, they are only deemed to be an employee. So it's a major gap that needs to be, needs to be blocked here. Right, well, I think we will close the session at that point because we could uh, go on in some detail, I think, about a number of these issues. So thank you very much to all of our guests. I'll close the session there and we'll reconvene once the public uh, gallery, I think it's called, is cleared. Thank you. <laughs>